This is not just a video about a documentary filmmaker. This is about a film that takes filmmaking to the next level. In this world, there's mystery even magicians don't understand, even though magicians are usually the ones controlling secrets. It's a documentary whodunit that challenges you to figure out the ultimate trick. Do you want to find out? I'm Hans, I'm a German filmmaker, and I'm also a magician. For my bachelor thesis, I was writing about how to combine narrative elements with interviews and documentary elements within one film. Then I thought, hey, we have this mystery in the magic community about this ominous author who wrote this really important book for the community. Expert at the Card Table by S.W. Erdnays. S.W. Erdnays. S.W. Erdnays. S.W. Erdnays. I have 50 or 60 different printings of the Expert at the Card Table. <laughs> it's still a groundbreaking book for its time. Considered as the Bible of card table artifice. But yet it's not just that. It's the mystery that surrounds who wrote it. It was sort of perfect as a project to combine the modern day search with the reenactment scenes and the period pieces of the time. Now I have to ask a question that's going to make me look dumb. Did I not understand that the same actor is playing four different characters? Yeah. <laughs> it's a documentary whodunit that challenges you to figure out the ultimate trick. So, how is this possible? We have three theories. Three different people that actually existed that might have been uh, the author of the book. We always have a conflict with each individual. For example, we follow the detective who tracked down this potential serial killer. This is sort of dramatic. We will find some way out. I am no murderer, Nalda. We then have someone who scams people in train. Do you have concrete reasons to make such serious allegations against me? Plenty. While needing to hide this from his um, boss. And then last but not least, we have the jail cell where our reporter interviews the potential candidate for SW Erdnays. I'm accused, not prosecuted, my little friend. There's maybe only one other documentary I could think of where you really feel like you're in a movie. To be honest, there's a lot of editors who don't really get it to that level where it just becomes really interesting storytelling. It was quite hard and we had a very, very detailed shot list. It's a huge table. For one, I obviously count how many shots I have, what will be on the slate later on, seeing shot my framing, whether I want it to be a long shot, a medium close up, push in or push out. So we go from a medium close up to a long shot. My perspectives, we start with the detail, with the close up of something frontal. And then we push out and reveal the entire scene until we end up with an establisher. The angle, whether I want it to be a low angle, a high angle, or I want to be eye level. How uh, the motion should take place. Obviously it's different if you have a dolly shot or if you are on a gimbal or you have a steady cam. And then what's actually happening on screen, characters, sound, VFX. I always have a master mark in red sort of as a security measure that I always know, okay, there is at least one way to, to cut the scene. Well, I gotta say, this is one of the most detailed shot lists I've seen. This is awesome. I'm gonna definitely take some of those ideas. If you want a copy of his shot list for your next project, click the link in the video description. Did you plan the shots yourself or did you work with a DP together? I work uh, with uh, my DP, Mark Tressel schmitz We have a very similar style, I would say, when it comes to visual storytelling. So when I say to him, I would like a warm, contrasty look, then he knows exactly what I'm talking about. So it's very easy for me to convey an emotion and Mark then train translates this to lighting. At what point did the editor come in? After four years, the project dragged over six years. So I started preparing for the structure and all of that. Right from the beginning, I sorted into documentary and reenactment scenes. So let's look into the interviews. This is all our interview partners, Guy Hollingworth. So we had a two camera setup, a medium close up and a medium shot. We open this already the synchronized timeline. You can see here that we mark the parts that are most interesting. We also created a second timeline where we already selected parts of them and named the different topics. We all also color coded them. So I know that everything in red 
is talking about this one journalist from the 50s. One of the biggest sources of what we think we know about Erdnais is the interviews that Martin Gardner did with the illustrator of the book, Marshall D. Smith, in 1946 and 1947. We knew that he phoned the actual illustrator of the book. Hello, Mrs. Smith. So I thought this would be a very good way to introduce the viewer to this reenactment level of storytelling. Well, I guess I'd have to start with his hands then. They were real soft, kind of like a woman's. So here we didn't want to show the face right from the beginning, but we've heard a description of the face. He was about 40 and fine features. It was a little bit uh, inspired by the opening scene of Leon the Professional, which is one of my favorite movies. The opening scene, we have also dialogue between Leon and his boss, and we only see the eyes and the lips. And this hooked me when I first saw, saw the film, and I thought this was a very mysterious way of introducing someone because then we have this entire break-in scene if i remember correctly it's the first time when he has the knife at the throat of the one um that he's going after detective jefferson may i help you i'll call you back the reference to Leon the Professional, is that something that happened in the editing that you're like, oh, why don't we do it like this? The scene wasn't actually meant to be cut like this. We actually had the reverse shot of our protagonist for uh, these dialogues. So we had to shift the dialogue, even reshot some close-ups of the hands. So we had something to show instead of a reverse shot. That's all I need. I would have never known, right, that this scene is sort of remix it. I think it's a really cool way for artists to like play with the with the art and take it to the next level like the opening shots with a stage and that table it feels very planned out can you talk a little bit about why you decided to open the film the way you did people perceive magic very differently when they perceive it live i uh, wanted to show without cuts so people would sort of get pulled into the the mystique of magic the desire to practice what we call close-up magic has expanded and it's become probably the most pursued form of magic. But it's already happened. Did you see it? No, you might have missed it. See, I actually managed to turn over one of the cards without you noticing. So far, we haven't really spoken about working with the editor, what that process was like. So Our first editor, she had made a timeline interview, best offs, and then already intercut sort of this statement of this interview partner would be very funny or informative or interesting in combination with this statement. We would just try to find a dramaturgical structure just in the statements of the interviewees. Then you can put the B-roll, archival footage, reenactment scenes as the last pieces of the puzzle. It's quite telling when you show this string out and then you see the final version of it, how much storytelling you add to it. I was sucked in very much and you just sort of live in that world. That's all I need. It wasn't obvious when to actually intercut. Every time we get into a new reenactment scene, we need to find a way to hook the audience again, to get them out of the modern day world and throw them uh, back into 1902. The scenes weren't written for this in particular. You still don't know what the interviewees will talk about with how intense an actual scene then turned out to, to be. Keep it. He was born with several ribs crushed. And that led to not only health problems of the digestive nature throughout his life, but it also meant he had quite a stoop. Only when we were stuck, um, then I would come in and sit next to the editing table, next to the keyboard. But I try to not do this too much because obviously the editor needs his or her creative freedom. That's yeah. well said. Editors like to work with the directors who say, okay, there's a problem. Now go find a way to fix it. And then we had to switch editors sort of mid midway. She was willing to throw over the structure and say, okay, what about if we take the last 20 minutes of the film and put it in the beginning? And I was like, oh, Okay, yeah, this could work. She wasn't afraid to try new things, and this gave the project a lot. If you have someone new and someone with new ideas and someone who is not biased by working on this project for so long, they have the courage to actually try all these impulses. This is very, very helpful. If people want to see this documentary, 
can they already see it? Yes, they can actually see it. They can go to www.earthnace-movie.com and stream it over there. In a couple of months, it will also be available as a download, hopefully. Awesome. If you're into documentary filmmaking, there's a new book by my film school buddy, Jacob Breaker. ACE. It's called How Documentaries Work. Jacob is an award-winning documentary filmmaker with docs premiering at Sundance and Berlin. He's also an associate professor at the University of Arizona School of Theater, Film and Television. And his books are used in schools around the world, including the prestigious USC Cinema of Arts, UCLA and the Met in London. I have a link for you that will give you access to a free section of his book. Plus, we're going to give away three copies. Sign up by clicking the link. Thanks for watching and happy editing.